Oh, uh, evening, folks. Wow, it's what a, you know, I look at all these people here, and I, I, I go out and look at the marquee to see if somebody else should be here. I don't know. <laughs> um, but then I, I, you know, I believe it's the material and not the lecturer here. Um, I, I got to tell you, being part of the, um, the lecture series here for the Far Harbor Historical Society, is, um, it's, it's an honor, uh, even though I feel like I've somehow cheated to get here, like I've <laughs> cut the line somehow to, to get in. Um, you know, my, my fellow lecturers, I mean, you know, Phil, I can remember the library when I was 18 and you showing me how to research my family. Um, I, it, I'm, I'm overwhelmed a little bit. Um, but anyway, uh, I start with this, uh, this slide here. Um, is anybody familiar with this sort of time period for the Ice House at Interlochen? 1970, exactly, yeah. Um, when I was a kid, um, first of all, my father would always tell me about Interlochen and that, but I was mostly confused about it. Uh, but I was always uh, drawn to it, if uh, nothing else, uh, but for... <laughs> How'd that happen? How'd you do it? We got the lights back. Did you? Yeah. Oops, watch your head. <laughs> so now we're going to switch it back. <laughs> we're going to connect the DC so you'll be good. Sorry. The technology is so exciting. Yeah. Well, this is nice, so yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you again. Yeah, a little bit, perhaps. Yeah, it does seem a little bit bright. Good? All right. All right. Um, the thing that first kind of drew me to is the fact that I grew up in the Ruggles Park area of Fall River. And uh, I, was, I was a little bit proud of the knuckleheads from the park who had uh, had the ingenuity before spray paint, you know, before spray paint cans were available to go out there and apparently bring ladders and buckets of paint and paint the word Ruggles um, highest on there. But that being said, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. Um, more and more now, and I guess I, I want to start off by this, um, this kind of uh, plea to, to stay with it. You know, if you have history in you, pass it on. Uh, I've been so inspired lately. I, I go on Facebook and, and a lot of that is, is sort of mindless stuff, but I'm seeing the, the uh, Fall River Historic Photo Club and I'm seeing these, any members here tonight? Yeah. Seeing these wonderful debates about you know, location of you know, objects and photos, maps, what they represent, and it's really hopeful. Um, share these things. It, it can't, obviously it can't just be us, people who are a little bit older, you have to share with your kids, you have to keep talking. My father talked about Interlaken, and um, it was, he was the author of many early visits to it, um, where I was lucky not to um, <laughs> get caught by the police. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I, I, I like to thank the people from uh, Ruggles Park for bringing this to our attention. Um, whenever I talk about, you know, and I, I should say the island, and everybody says Interlaken, Interlaken, Interlaken. Um, it, we'll we'll kind of go over it here. First of all, it, it is an island, right? Now it is an island. Um, you can see it. This is from um, Google, uh, Google Earth, I think. And you can see it's, um, it's an island. It's connected by a small causeway from um, New Boston Road. Um, before the highway was there, New Boston Road ran right across, and you could get right down into the island. And of course, there's a small causeway in the back of the island, too. Wasn't always an island. It became an island when the city decided that they were going to dam part of the Quickishan River uh, near downtown, and it flooded a lot of area in the um, Pleasant Street area in that, and it also raised the pond levels. And so what we have here is uh, this little blue outline around, you see the island on the right, 
Um, that's where the water level, um, had, where the land had been, but as the water level went up, you can see how it became surrounded. It had just been a bit of a peninsula before that. And uh, I'm not sure, there might be Highland Brook that was running down into the area, that marshy area next to it. This too I would, um, you know, going way back in history, uh, this is the, um, the Freeman's Purchase Lots. When the city was, was bought up from the Native Americans, um, Investors bought whole strips of it. And the ones that comprise Interlochen uh, are, were bought by Edmund Chandler and Christopher Wadsworth. Um, I'm pretty sure both were from Duxbury. And this, of course, is in the 1600s. But uh, Edmund Chandler ended up uh, selling his to Thomas Brightman, Brightman, I believe. He was from Little Compton. And the Brightmans owned that and other parts of it from the Watupa Pond all the way down to the uh, Taunton River. For, for generations. I don't know if you can see this. this is the I, I, I'm such a history nerd. I just I, I put this stuff in as I'm thinking about it. I want to illustrate the fact that in 1812, you see the Quickashan River? It was right over there. It, it was still this thin little river. It hadn't swollen. It hadn't filled the, the whole, even the area that we see now. So this has to do with, um, and this is rather light, but a, a damming that took place right down here. This is a lithograph of Fall River from 1877. We can still see it's depicted as a bit of a peninsula. And you can see what is the early ice houses um, on the island. This again. The proper name of it Interlochen, in fact, was the name of the estate that was on the island that belonged to Spencer Borden that will be lectured to you uh, about next week. Um, Cunningham Island, to my knowledge, is the proper name for the island. <clears throat> the first real resident on it was a man named B.P. Cunningham. And this is a map from 1850 that shows uh, B.P. Cunningham's house um, on what's depicted as a peninsula more than an island. If you, you can see here some of his neighbors, and I don't know if my mouse is going to work like this, but you see the, you know, the Brightman graveyard, which is still there. Um, I saw the Messiers came in. This is right near their house. Um, and this is New Boston Road. B.P. Cunningham was a flint merchant. He built a house there, at least by 1850, he had a house on the island. And this is, uh, this is an image. I'm going to try to be a little bit more careful about where I get my images from. This is an image that I, I lifted from the, um, the Fall River history, history book, Pictorial History of Fall River. And this shows B.P. Cunningham's store. Um, it's my understanding it's in the Flint, but then I don't understand the church spire back there, unless that's perhaps Bogle Street Congregational Church. I'm not sure. Um, but, hmm? I see. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. So. <laughs> I was racking my brain trying to think about it. So, uh, B.P. Cunningham was um, was a Flint merchant, very successful too. Um, these are taken from Forest City directories, and you have to forgive me if they don't have the date on there. I, I'm sure that I can't tell you um, them. Uh, very very well to do. Um, guy. He was in Fall River not for that long. He moved to Providence and then ultimately to Boston. The house on the island, we have very few pictures of the house as it existed on the island. This is an old picture and I, I'm afraid to, I'm jumping into Stephanie Corey's material here. Um, this is uh, a Spencer Borden picture but it shows in the background here and I've got to try to get my, my mouse working. You can see this house right over here. This is the B.P. Cunningham house as it existed um, on the interlock and estate with Spencer Borden. Uh, the house was eventually uh, purchased um, and moved from the island and it, it, it's still extant. And uh, I, I do believe we have the, the owner of the house here tonight. Yes, 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 uh, yes. There you are. <laughs> there you are. Uh, beautiful, beautiful um, transitional federal to Greek revival style house. Um, how, are, how am I 
my architect people here, what years are we talking about for these types of houses? What's that? Early 1800s. Early 1800s, right through Greek revival style is in full swing about 1845, 1850. Um, this is transitional. Beautiful, chaste house. Thank God it was saved. I, uh, going through my notes for the presentation today, I, I went on Google Earth and I, and I found this. One, because I think you should all drive by this house. It's at uh, 132 Bark Street. It's beautiful. Um, but I wanted to include this flagpole. Do, are you familiar with the, is this a story about the flagpole? Yeah, that came from Interlock. It came from It's a ship's mast, right? Yeah. Right, okay, it's a ship's mast and it's probably because the, uh, the Bordens were so interested in, in sailing and down in Newport and that, so uh, Spencer Borden Jr. particularly. The house is in the style, and it's funny, you have to you have to bear with me here. Uh, the house is in the style of, of several other Greek revival uh, houses in the city. And it, it was funny, as I, I, was, I was thinking about it, I said, well, I'm just going to put these photos in because I'm a bit of a Greek revival nut. Uh, this is the Oliver Buffington House on Hanover Street, uh, which was built right about the same time. I think it was about 1850. And um, the, the reason I think about it is because B.P. Cunningham, he was successful. He was a really well-to-do guy. And he was a guy who owned a business in the Flint, but would make his way out to Cunningham Island each night to go to bed. Um, it was that time in Fall River's history, and perhaps in American history, that after some industrialization, that people had decided that, you know what, being in the city is not the best thing, and you, you really have to get to the country to, to be healthy. <coughs> In the case of B.P. Cunningham, he just wanted to get away from the busy Flint area. In the case of Oliver Buffington, and I get this from a conversation with Florence Brigham when I was a very, very young man, um, she said that Oliver Buffington's wife was sick. He was a downtown merchant, he had a flower shop, and the, his wife was sick and the doc said, you, well, you have to take your wife out to the country to get her better. And so he took her out to the country, right at Hanover Street. <laughs> <laughs> in Maple. <laughs> there are a couple of big hospital buildings around it now. Um, <laughs> also, I, I just had to, um, I, I cry over this house a lot. Does anybody know this house? No? No, 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 it's, it's like one that was on New Boston Road that unfortunately is not with us anymore. Uh, this house is on Quarry Street in Fall River. Um, you can't recognize it now because it's covered with siding. The picket fence is filled in with like uh, brick. Yeah, um, really, really been changed. Being a homeowner now, I have, uh, I have some appreciation of vinyl siding, but not, not on a house like this. Anyway, I include it. Uh, because it is so much in the style of the house on the island. And this too, um, when you look at it from the city properties, Patriot Properties, they dated about 1870. But this house is pretty clearly an 1840s house. It's, it's a bit older. And you can see uh, the obvious sort of style consistencies wow. between the two, right? You can, you can see it very, very clearly. Interesting story about this house. Um, and this is, you know, as historians, you have these little pet projects that you do. Um, I've been told, and, I, and I'm getting ready to break in um, to this house because <laughs> I've knocked on the door a few times, that the old line dividing Fall River in Rhode Island, like Tiverton in Rhode Island, supposedly passes right through this. Phil, had you heard about that? Um, and that there's a mark on the hearth of the fireplace denoting where the line used to go through. I guess they call it, it's not the line of Division Street, perhaps, but... I've knocked on the door a couple of times, nobody answers. I think I'm too scary, but I'm going to ask to, <laughs> to see their fireplace. They're selling it now. I might take a, a real estate tour through just to get a gander. <laughs> anyway, um, natural ice industry. And now industry, I, that's a bit of a, a, bit of a mis, misnomer. Because um, truthfully, while it had industrial elements, it, it wasn't industry. It was agriculture. It was agriculture. Ice wasn't produced at this time. That came a little bit later. Ice was harvested. Ice was cultivated. And so it was treated more as an agricultural activity. People had been collecting ice for a long time. A long time. 
It was only when people started to say, you know, we can make a bit of money doing this, that it became, you know, a hot button commodity. Frederick Tudor from Boston, the so-called ice king of the world, um, figured out how to do this. He said, you know, we've got a lot of water and we have a lot of cold weather and the two of them <laughs> produce pretty good ice and we should do something with it. And so Frederick Tudor got in his head saying, you know, I can ship this ice all over the place. And so he started this, this business shipping ice to places where people really don't have it. Uh, it's only a very narrow band in the United States where you can produce ice during the winter of any thickness and regularity. Well, at least we used to be. I think we're finding a change in our climate now. That it would, uh, you would be able to put it enough away to have something left, excuse me, for the summer months. Um, I always like this, notwithstanding any sort of um, racial implications from this. Uh, the fact that um, shipping ice to Cuba and having... The, natives um, <laughs> totally unaware of anything that cold and that little one guy going, oh my God, this is too cold to touch. Um, what a novelty ice would be in a time when there was no refrigeration, when you lived in a tropical climate to actually see ice. It's like those cousins who have never seen snow and come to visit you in New England in the winter. Didn't take long for people to catch on. Uh, to the fact that ice was, uh, it was lucrative. Uh, let me give you a little lesson about ice. Um, nobody owns the top of the water too much. At least before people started harvesting ice, nobody really thought much about it. Ice was ice. And so you could go take ice from the top of a pond and it really didn't cost you anything except the effort and the labor to take it in and store it. And so it was pretty lucrative. It was pretty lucrative. You didn't need any raw material except water, and that seemed to replenish itself. And so Robert Cook and William Durfee uh, decided to turn this into a business enterprise, and they did. Uh, Phil, I stole this from your book. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> When I, when I first started teaching, I had a bunch of students who worked on um, a project on, for interlocking with me, and students were actually opening books, you know, books, you guys know, but it's hard for them. Um, yeah, they, you know, they had to open books and, and copy things, and, and they, they came in with this, and so we used it, and so Phil, thank you. Um, and this, um, this is the ice house that they built. Uh, I want to get my mouse working so I can kind of show it to you here. There we go. Uh, as we, and we're all familiar probably, at least, at least we used to be, it's getting a little bit overgrown now. When you drive up Route 24, when you're driving north on Route 24 between 190, heading up from 195, and you look across the pond on your right, um, I, some of you, I, most everybody knows this, some of you don't, and you look across and there's the, the, the remains of this building over there. That's what we're looking at right here, is this, this building right here. Um, it's funny, I, I worked with um, our librarian at Diamond Regional, and when I told him that I, I had an interest in this, and I told him what I was looking at, he said, that's so funny. He said, when I was a kid, my sister and I, we used to drive through there, and we weren't from the area, and the two of them were convinced that these were the remains of the Alamo. <laughs> yeah, you know, Davy Crockett, yeah. yeah. I, I know that people in Texas would be very upset with their <laughs> faulty understanding, and he was a very bright guy. It was just a little kid thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so these are the remains that we see, and what we would be doing now if we were taking this photo, we would be standing in the middle of New Boston Road, we would be looking to the east, and we would look at the Cook, um, Cook Durfee Ice House. Here's another angle of how it looked when it was operating. Um, what most people don't realize is that there was a whole nother ice house beside it, in back. Much bigger, much bigger. Um, people will still see the remains of this barn. Uh, one thing I would kind of point out here is that this giant granite ice house 
is a total anomaly. No, nobody built ice houses like this. Cook, Durfee built this with the idea that this ice house, that the ice industry would last forever. It's, they just didn't see it coming. We were only, you know, maybe 30 years away from mechanical ice production. Um, but they built for a lifetime. It's beautiful. In fact, after there was a fire on the property, after it burned down, the city had debated what to do with it. They said, well, maybe we should tear it down. And then somebody said, yeah, I don't think so. Two foot granite walls, 30 feet high, um, 40 feet, I, I actually forget the dimensions. It was too much. What were they going to do with the stone? Bring it into the city to put it somewhere? They left it. Our, our luck, I guess. I guess. A little bit different angle. We'll be visiting the island, and I, and I probably should have said this right off, on Saturday the 21st, not this coming Saturday, the Saturday after, we're going to conduct a tour. Mike, are we good? Okay. Um, Saturday the 21st at 10 p.m. We'll meet at um, Meridian Street. 10 p.m. Be night. 10 a.m. I lied. <laughs> I lied. I'll take a drink of water after that here. 10 a.m. <laughs> Saturday the 21st, July. We'll be meeting at the, uh, there's a gate to the property at the very beginning of Meridian Street. When you follow Meridian Street, uh, when you follow New Boston Road over across the overpass, to, uh, is that Hy Hyacinth? Willow. Willow. And you cross over, right there there's, there's a gate that we can, we can get in. Um, and we'll, we'll start the tour from there. It's, it's a little bit of a walk. And so if, if that's, you know, an issue for you, 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 might, you might think about that. Um, and a personal, a personal plea is that I love going there. Uh, I, I love to visit the island. I love to talk to people. I, I love to go into the ruins. I hate ticks. And there's plenty of ticks in there. If you go, and I'm not saying don't, don't go. I'm going to go. Um, I wear light-colored clothing. I wear light colored clothing so I can, I can see these things when they're on me. If you go, just try to do that. Everybody wants to be rough and rugged and they put their Levi's on to go out there and good luck seeing a tick the size of a pinhead on there. So uh, keep it in mind. This is, um, I guess this is one of the plan books from the city of Fall River. I, Whenever I, I plan to do this talk, I have so many materials, I, I, I go through them, I'm like, oh my, look, look at this. Um, and so, so I, I came across this and I wanted to include it uh, for the reason that, a couple of things that are interesting. One, because the wooden ice house, the one that burned completely, is, um, is quite big, quite big, and that's the one that was probably most profitable to them. The granite one, the one that is still extant, uh, the walls at least, was a lot smaller. Um, one of the things that you might want to visit as you make your way into it is you might want to visit the, um, the steam engine room here at the end of the ice house. Um, ice houses uh, didn't fill themselves and you needed motors to get stuff inside of it. And so you would have a steam boiler in here that would power lifts to bring ice inside. And so right on this building that you were trying to keep exceptionally cold, uh, you would have a steam boiler running. Go figure. Um, <laughs> you, you would just think they would separate it, but I, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe I guess when you ran the thing that um, it wasn't filled, so you didn't have to worry about the heat too much. And when you stopped running it, guess what? Your ice house was full. So, uh, but you'd be able to see the remnants of that. Another thing they'd be able to see the, here, they used to keep um, their horses in here. Ice houses did not own horses, they leased them. It was only a half year industry. And that being said, truly, it was only a few months that it actually operated. Um, ice would be harvested between January and March at the latest to own horses, to feed horses for a whole year because they were used intimately in this agricultural process would not be cost effective. Uh, but they would be kept here. There was a barn here as well. And there was, you'll also see, if you go on the island, the remains of a scale. When you were selling ice from the ice house, you would put ice into a wagon. and However, when the wagon came onto the island, it was weighed. And then you filled it with ice, and when it left again, it was weighed again. Simple math would tell you how much ice you had, and you would pay accordingly. 
It's, it's funny too, let me go back here. These buildings um, that you see at the top of the screen, and it takes a while for the mouse to kick in. Uh, these are entirely underwater now. The pond is higher than it has ever been. This too, I just thought I'd share with you. It's, it's a, a bit of a rare photo. It's not in very good shape, but this is a picture of all of the island, Cunningham Island. And um, this is the ice, the ice house is right here. And anybody speculate where this picture was taken from? The tower. The water, right, the water tower. Water tower. I don't think there are many like this. This is, um, I believe it was Philip Borden, the city engineer from the time who took it. Uh-oh. Granting the blues portion of our presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, going through my materials, I found this picture today. I was like, isn't this lovely? Didn't know I had it, so I just put it in. I just think it's great. This had to have been not too long after um, the fire. The, the ladders are still extant. Um, they, ha they have color. This is what we'd be looking at nowadays. And if we go to visit, this is, this is pretty much what we'll see. <clears throat> with any sort of enterprise, any sort of agricultural enterprise, people aren't going to harvest things that aren't needed. So people needed ice. At first they didn't know it, but then they found out, wow, this is really great. And the ice was used for several different things. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't think I wanted to do that here. Do, 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 do. Let me go back here. As, as, need, oops, as, as need grew, as people wanted more ice, pe people stepped in to fill the gap with it. Durfee and Cook sold out to the uh, Arctic Ice Company, and they, um, they harvested ice here and at different places near the Narrows and even, I think, into Tivenin as well. Uh, many ice dealers sort of sprang up here. And it was funny, I was, I was just researching this stuff the other day, this is a city directory, and I was saying, wow, there's, there's certainly a lot of ice dealers who, who stepped up, but, if, but of course me, I'm always, like, I'm always looking at demographics. Uh, anybody see a changing demographic, how the ice industry is changing the hands from a cook in Durfee? And, yeah, the French, the French are taking over here. Um, and, well, this is just the way it goes, isn't it? You know, you have a, a couple of entrenched businesses. The guys are making a lot of money. That picture of Bill Durfee that we looked at before, he looked like he was doing well. Uh, Phil, I, I think in your book you share a story. Then he got pulled over for speeding. He had uh, quite a nice car and liked to drive it around quickly. And uh, it seemed like the, uh, the French people who were coming into town were probably um, a little bit hungrier. And um, look at this. Look at the names. Corvo. Guy, is it Guy? You have to say Guy, right? <laughs> Guy. These, like, these are about the Frenchest names I've ever seen. Imagine that, Ouellette is about the least French name there, if you can believe it. Payette, you know. <laughs> Morissette. Different ice dealers popping up all over the place. Um, in fact, the Arctic Ice House and the ice house that we go to see, these weren't the only ice houses in town. There were ice houses everywhere. They were all over the, uh, you know, Fewer on the North Watapa Pond, many on the South Watapa. Uh, ice houses in Stafford Pond, there were ice houses in the Sonnet. And it, it's funny though, I was trying to put my, I was looking at some old maps, trying to put my finger on where they might be. In this old picture, I think this is from 1877, this picture of the South Watapa Pond. And this looks to me like it could be an ice house. And this over here, I believe would be Suckerbrook. And this would have been the bleachery over here. Yes, the bleachery? The end of Jefferson Street? Yeah? Okay. Everybody knows Sucker Brook. If I hear one more story about the fish that they used to pull out of there, everybody knows Sucker Brook. <laughs> um, this is a picture. Stephanie, Corey, I believe you gave this to me. This is a, an unattributed picture of ice harvesting on the South Watapa Pond. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this photo later to talk about the ice harvesting techniques. Um, there was an ice house down on Crab Pond, and if you, if you want to orient yourself, Anawan Street with two ends, still the same one, Water Street, and here's Crab Pond, and I would think that 
this would be an ice house right about here. Ice houses were always, always located right on the pond. They don't, you know, you didn't want to be hauling ice over ground if you had to. And the best ice houses were always in proximity of transportation. Lots of railroad down there and they could ship ice all over the place. A couple of ice houses and um, I, I've seen this picture float around a lot. It's been on the uh, Fall River Historic Photo group on Facebook. And it shows not one, but two ice houses here. There's one over here on the left. We see the conveyor. Um, ice houses, notoriously, they didn't need windows. In fact, they didn't want windows. They wanted to stay closed and cold. And another here. And of course, look at that. Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Alas, no more. Uh, the process of harvesting, and, and again, I, I warn you, I'm a bit of a nerd here. Um, if, if this is too much, just tell me to, to speed it up. <laughs> I, I, I've always been interested in the fact that th this is agriculture. It's not, it, it's not industry. It's agriculture. They were industrial tools. They were tools that were manufactured. They were used in the process. And ultimately, we started to have saws and in, in different sort of mechanical uh, instruments that we used to harvest ice, but it was still an agricultural enterprise. So we say harvest. Um, this is a film, an Edison film. You can find this on the Library of Congress website, American Memory Maker. And Thomas Edison uh, took the time to <laughs> film ice making. And I gotta get my, yeah, he filmed lots of things and these are just, they're just great. And hopefully it's gonna play for me. Come on, baby. If not, I have it on my flash drive. I insist on having it play. Okay, watch this. So I'll, I'll go over this stages later, but this is how ice was harvested. And, and, and it's funny, the, the horses and, you know, this is a real agricultural enterprise, even though there's no plants involved. Um, teams of men, the men would be hired seasonally, just like horses, and they would work the fields. I was just down at Charlie's Oil the other day, and uh, they had a pair of ice tongs hanging on the wall. And I, I said, what do we have ice tongs there for? And the woman behind the counter said, well, the guy who owned Charlie's Oil used to do ice in the off season. And so he would deliver oil and they would do ice as well. He said, we've got a picture of his old truck that we delivered ice with too. And so this was seasonal employment and it was, um, it was lucrative. It's not like we're in the Arctic Circle. I mean, <laughs> the cold did end. What's that? You know, it was funny, ice could be harvested, the, the lower end that I hear is about six inches. But um, I was just reading a journal entry from uh, uh, an Anthony who was a meat packer in Fall River during this time. He was talking about ice being between nine and 12 inches thick. Yeah. Winters were colder. Um, he, he tr this, this gentleman tracked temperatures and that, and winters were colder. There's no doubt about it. I'm not here to, to spout about global warming, but something is changing. Uh, we, we've had some ice and we've had some good ice, but nothing like this, nothing we could run people out for for six months. So let me switch back here and from current slide. Okay. For the ice harvesting operation, one of the first things you would have to do is because oddly enough it's winter and you have so much ice, uh, so much snow that you have to clear it off the ice. And so they would use horses and they would, and they would call it this tool, right, a scoop scraper. That's, well, it well, sounds like poop scraper. <laughs> they, would, uh, they would clear the ice. I invariably in the short time that this, this industry flourished, uh, people acquired uh, tastes and they liked their ice a certain way. They wanted clear ice and they didn't want it to be all crusty. And so they, you know, they would take some time to clear the ice. If you left snow on, ice would not freeze properly. You would have this big frosty layer at the top. It would melt too quickly. Nobody wanted it. 
The best ice was clear ice. The first step was cleaning the ice. The next part, it's, I wish I had more high school students in here. I would tell them about the importance of geometry for this. Um, you needed your ice field to be square. You had to start with a square. If it wasn't square, <laughs> the cut of your ice would be all messed up. You'd have, instead of having perfectly square blocks of ice, you would have these parallelograms, and you would probably have your ice house tipping over on you as it all started to shift. And it would melt too quickly, too. So what these guys would do is they would go out on the ice and with the surveyor's precision, they would mark off a perfect right angle. Um, some farmers used to just build it out of a couple of pieces of wood and they had it all measured out. And you had to have one straight line. And you take that one straight line and you would cut it in with an initial cut. You would run a, I forget, I forget the tool that they used for this, but it would cut a small groove. And then what you would do is you would go down and you would open that up a little bit. And once you opened up that initial groove, you would use this, this device here. So you would cut one groove, and as you cut the one groove, you would put the side of this device in it. And then the other side, which was 22 inches wide, would cut your next groove. And they would pull it down the ice, and what this would do, and you can see it here, it would create this... Um, why does it take so long to get this? These parallel cuts. And they would do this the length of the ice field in one direction, and they would do it in the other direction as well. And so the, the markings on the ice were a perfect 22 by 22. Some bigger ice houses would use bigger pieces of ice, some as big as 44, but it meant bigger machinery, and it was a little bit tougher to handle. Uh, the good news was it kept longer. Uh, the, the surface of the ice, even though you've plowed it, it would be kind of rough if anybody's ever tried to skate outside in the winter. You know that you would have those beautiful days where the ice was perfectly clear and you're like, this is great. Then you'd have the other days it was just totally, you know, bumpy and it was rough. Um, they would use a snow ice plane to make it nice and smooth. If the ice wasn't smooth, it wouldn't stack well. And so this was probably the nicest part of the job that you could just... <laughs> Good to sit. Of course, you never know what's going to come out of that horse in front of you. <laughs> As you watch the film there, did anybody see the guys running around with the, uh, the little carts on the ice? Yeah, it's funny, especially in Fall River. Uh, Fall River realized pretty quickly that um, the North Watupa Pond it was a pure water source. And... Um, they wanted to keep it that way, and they took lots of steps, and as we visit the island, you see they installed the uh, intercepting drain. Um, they, they stopped a lot of the, the little streams that were flowing into it because they thought they were going to carry contaminants from the city. And another thing that they didn't want was horses pooping on the ice. They said, you know, we don't mind the harvest, we like the ice, but we don't like the poop, right? And so they would have to have inspectors on the ice all the time, and they would have to have guys who go out there, and once a horse dropped it's low there, they would have to pick it right up. So it would be a whole job. I think I'd rather cut ice, but I don't know. <laughs> this guy had a bird's eye view for it. Um, this device, he would sit on it, would have a, a little knife blade that would be at approximately a 45 degree angle. As weight was put on it, it would get dragged across, it would smooth the ice off nice and flat. Easier for stacking. The next thing they would do, uh, you would think the first part would be plowing, where they remove the snow. No, they had it all backwards. Plowing was cutting. Plowing was cutting. And so they would have this device would be pulled by a, a horse, and in the grooves that you would got, you would put this in here, and the horse would pull it, and it would cut down through the ice. Not fully, because that could be dangerous, right? If you cut right through the ice, you'd be in there. Yeah. So they would have, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> That was probably an early lesson for the, uh, the ice industry. Um, it, it's funny, I, I read, um, I read an account where they said that horses used to occasionally fall in the water. And uh, yeah, it was an expensive thing. And they used to keep, this sounds terrible, they used to keep a noose on their neck. And as soon as they fell in, they would pull it tight so the horse wouldn't take in water. And if they did that quickly and got the horse out, really not much harm was done. Um, it sounds terrible, but these people were pretty ingenious, so I imagine it was effective. <coughs> So the plow would be pulled across the ice and be pulled in one direction and a little bit in the other. You had to make sure you didn't go through. 
and you again you would follow the lines that have been made so they were pretty pretty parallel I look at the lines that they make and they're a lot better than the ones I, I have on my lawn when I'm trying to cut it so um, I think they were doing okay <laughs> a, a, a funny thing if you didn't think about it how to cut your ice you could cut yourself off from wherever you're trying to get your ice here <laughs> you know you had you had to plan this out right so uh, you would cut a canal that would lead back to your your ice house and that and then you would start breaking ice off at the farthest part of it and moving closer to your ice house uh, nobody wanted to move the ice that far I mean it was floating but it was still quite heavy um, but it was, it was a necessary evil. The thing that they had to do to do it, they had all the cuts, it wasn't cut all the way through, and they would, um, they would call barring it off. They would put a bar in and kind of pry it off like you might expect. They would do it in pieces that were bigger so that they could float them in. You wouldn't want to cut 100 little pieces of 22 by 22 inch ice to have to drag them all back to the ice house. So you would bring the bigger piece, you would float it in, and then cut it up as you get closer to it. Makes sense. They moved it around with car ice hooks. I brought some, I'll, I'll show them to you later. Uh, they, with ice hooks, I have a car one that's made for railroad cars. Uh, ice saws were used. Um, I see a lot of these, I'm, I'm a nerd, I buy the tools, I keep, if you, if, you wanna make, if you have any of these tools, just put them on eBay and charge me a lot of money, I'll, I'll do it. Um, I was so excited to buy an ice saw when I bought it, I didn't realize that I had to ship it from Ohio. It weighs about 70 pounds. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, my wife was so pleased. Um, <laughs> uh, you recognize an ice saw, it's got the little curve in it, but the, um, the handle, rather than if you had a saw, like uh, here's the flat part of your saw, and you're cutting wood, your handle would be like this. When you cut ice, your handle was like this, so that you could reach up and down and cut into the water. That's the difference between an ice saw and a wood saw. I'll leave that undone. Ice saws. A whole industry, the, uh, the wood company, um, <laughs> got rich just creating ice tools. Look at the prices, though. I paid a lot more for mine, let me tell you. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, the canal that they would cut. It would go to um, a conveyor. Uh, the conveyors were probably the most expensive part of the operation aside from the house. Um, they, they came in, in different sizes, in different designs. Um, let me see here. Ah, it's okay. I'll get to that. Uh, so, uh, the ice harvest literally was like the biggest news in town. I can imagine a cold winter in Fall River, um, even, even now I'm not too excited about winters in Fall River, it can, you know, it can be a little dry. Um, but these people, they actually carried the harvesting of the ice in the newspaper, they, they, they covered it, right? And um, they would go out and they would talk about the quality of the ice and who was cutting. And, um, and you wouldn't believe how many of these articles I've read just trying to you know, to get a handle on it. You know, you want to know your material. But a lot of it is pretty boring stuff. I mean, you know, w watching water freeze, okay, that's pretty exciting. Um, but then cutting it is, uh, is off too. This was a, a story that I came across and it, it caused me great joy. Apparently, because the water surface really, and I'm sorry for having you read, but you should be able to see it and I'll just talk while you're taking a look at it. Uh, the, the surface of the water technically belonged to no one until the city decided to come in and take a heavy hand in what happened with the water. And so competing ice companies would go in and try to get a better take on the ice. And to do that, of course, you know, you could, you could just try to be honest about it and say, okay, we're, we're really nice people, so you take half the pond, we'll take half the pond. Uh, but they didn't do that. They would go out and they would try to cut a canal a little bit farther out, that, you know, than their competitors could get out, and so that it, you know, it would be hard to harvest harvest ice past a canal, and so they would do that and try to literally steal ice from other companies so that they couldn't get to it. And uh, there was a whole incident where one company here was trying to keep another company from getting it, and they were sneaking out at night, and they had spies planted out on the ice to, <laughs> to make sure that nobody was getting the, the extra ice. Um, <laughs> I, I'm telling you, when you're reading 
newspaper articles about frozen water. This is pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> I, was <laughs> I was quite excited. Oh, ice harvest. Oh, it's funny, they talk about tapping the ice too. It says uh, the ice was about six inches in thickness. Uh, that, was, that was kind of a baseline for cutting, but what they would do is a lot of times they would go down the ice and they would drill into it. They would drill through the ice, and of course at that time they would do that because that's how they would check the ice. They would have a special tool they would put in the drill hole and had a little hook on the end, and so they would put it down and kind of hook the ice and pull it up, and they would be able to tell the depth of the ice. Uh, but at the same time, if the ice wasn't of sufficient thickness, they would keep drilling holes. And what would happen, the water would come up from underneath and it would flood the top. And you would start to add thickness to your ice. It didn't create the best quality ice, but it was still, if ice wasn't happening, it was a way to get it thicker quickly so you could get ice in your ice house. Uh, the conveyors, conveyors uh, had two kind, kind of float, like went under the water, and another kind that went over the water. What most people, it's funny, people have this idea about, um, I, I had students working on this years ago, and they were supposed to be researching, you know, ice harvesting and that. And we were doing tours in the island, I'd heard one of them describing how the ice was put onto different floors of the ice house. Um, <laughs> ice houses, there were no floors. The ice house would be from floor to ceiling wide open. On the bottom, you'd have about a foot of sawdust. And if you had any, whatever was below it would be kind of pitched towards the middle of the ice house. The reason for this is you didn't want it pitched away because you would have literally tons of ice pushing out against the wall of your ice house. Not good. Uh, it wasn't uncommon for poorly constructed ice houses to wreck. Just, just go, just go right over. Um, but if you cut your ice correctly, and if you cut it square, and if you've leveled it out, and I wonder if I can show you something here. One thing that they used to do is if you look over here where the ice would come up the conveyor, they would scrape it one more time. See these tools here? And what they would do, they would cut it to a uniform thickness. And it created a job for the guy who had to keep shoveling the, ch you know, the chipped ice out of here. But it made the floor perfectly square. Everything was level, it would fit in perfectly. And they would slide it in, and they would slide it around. Um, you didn't want dead ice. If ice stopped moving, apparently it was heck to get it going again. They would slide it in, it would be, boys, keep her moving. And they had this, you know, what was the term? It was, it was kind of sexist, you know, get her, move her while she's hot, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I read it the other day, I laughed, I, said, I forgot about that one. Um, <laughs> Moving ice was good ice, because if not, you can imagine standing on ice, trying to get a huge chunk of ice to move just using, you can see these little <laughs> ice hooks. It was murder. Slide them in and keep them moving. See those guys just about running, they would fill the whole house that way. And as the house filled, if you look at the house uh, at uh, New Boston Road, they have the big openings up the side. They would bring the ice in there, and as the ice got up to a certain level, close the doors. And as it filled up, close the doors. Close the doors, and you would fill the whole house that way. Uh, the house was filled. It would keep a well-packed ice house that had good ventilation. It wasn't sitting right in the sun. If packed, could last two to three years. Two to three years. Um, some of the keys, it, it's funny, for the short time that this, in, this agricultural enterprise existed, I keep saying industry, um, people figured out a lot about it. And the big enemy, one, was um, you needed ventilation. You needed ventilation because you had to have whatever was melting, you had to either have it flow away or evaporate out. You didn't want a lot of heat, but you wanted to do it. The only enemy of ice is water. Right? So they would have them well ventilated and they would keep. And of course you wanted them to keep so that you could sell them during the summer months. And here we have, this is a picture from Mr. Aaron House. Uh, Cook and Durfee, I don't know, can you see that? Yeah. Cook and Durfee Ice House. 
right? In far of a national bank. Yeah, I do that too. Like, you have the image in front, and I'm just like, oh, what's behind it? <laughs> Whereas they're like, you know, try to blow it up. What does this sign say back here? <laughs> uh, William Wood Company uh, became famous for their ice tools. Uh, I have some ice tools down here you'd be able to take a look at. Different uh, Philadelphia tongs, Kansas. I mean, really, you know. <laughs> Yeah I, yeah, I don't know. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I had to try, I have a bunch of ice tongs myself, and um, I tried to pick up some ice with it. You would think they're ice tongs, right? It's like, you, it, it's almost impossible. It, it, you have to have um, total confidence. You have to kind of hook them on and, and just pull it up with full expectation that it's going to grab. Because if you're at all ginger or you try to do it slowly, you just get that terrible metal ice grate sound. And, it's, and then you'll have two blocks of ice before you know it. Hopefully during the walk, I'm going to talk to the Crystal Ice Company, see if they'll give me a couple of cakes. We can try to move some. Um, ice axes were used in the vans to break them up. I have an ice axe you can take a look at later. Ice shavers. One of the things for me, I, again, I'm a nerd. I, I say, okay, ice, 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 ice. How much ice can you use, really? I mean, how much ice can you use? Who, who uses this ice? Why, why all this ice? Well, let me tell you. Railroads. Railroads were already into pleasing their passengers, and they bought tons of ice. Right. This is the uh, Forever Providence Railroad Company. What is that? 105 days, 50 pounds of ice per day. Per day. That's a little bit, huh? That's a little bit. I don't know if I quit the day job to supply that, but that's just a small part of it. Cook and Durfee. Um, yeah, what about the, the Forever Line? Everybody, oh, the, the Floating Palace. Well, somebody had to make them a palace, and part of it was um, kitchen, kitchen staff, right? Galley, galley, galley. It's probably why I had a hard time finding it. Uh, I was trying to find a better copy of a, um, a menu, one, because the, the price is, I think they have a lobster up there for 50 cents. <laughs> yeah, and that's with, uh, yeah, 50, it's, it's up here somewhere with the tail. Um, I was looking through a, an old Fall River history book, and I found this, though. This is, this is the Fall River line, all right? Immense nightly travel, <laughs> a ton of roasts, steaks, chops, 200 pounds of poultry, right? bread. Is that 300 pounds of butter? Good Lord. 240 dozen eggs, milk. <laughs> Um, I think they needed ice, don't you? <laughs> I think they needed ice, and I think they needed a lot of it, and they needed it regularly. As we go from cruise ships to uh, beer, right? Nice combination here. Breweries needed ice. Um, any, any more people brew beer nowadays? Anybody brew? You brew? During the summer, what happens sometimes? You gotta control your brew. It brews too quickly, right? It gets too hot. Um, beer makers used to use ice to control the fermentation process. You didn't want it to ferment too quickly, apparently. What's this famous place? Monticello. Monticello. I keep hoping there's younger people in here. You know, we all know it's Monticello. Um, Thomas Jefferson, he had an ice house. This is his ice house. This is the old domestic design. They would put the ice down, which makes no sense to me whatsoever. If you put it down, you have to lift it out. No thank you. Um, it was pretty heavy. Um, but the reason um, Thomas Jefferson, anybody know why he was such a, why he wanted ice so much? He had a lot of parties. He did have a lot of parties. <laughs> he had a sweet tooth too. He came back from France with a recipe for ice cream. And he loved to, who doesn't love ice cream? <laughs> if you go online, you can, you can make ice cream just like Thomas Jefferson did. Even though you gotta figure out what sabatier is, I'm not even sure what that is. But 
Apparently, people in Fall River were pretty, <laughs> pretty enamored of ice cream, too. Uh, and, and, I, and I go back, I love to go back through these city directories here. Um, ice cream and sherbets. Right, ice cream in bonbons. Bonbons. Everywhere. Is that supposed to be hygiene? <laughs> I hope so. Uh, cl clean ice was important. As ice became manufactured, more and more people had more demands for their ice being clean. Um, pure distilled water. Yep. Zero to four. Imagine that. Like, to have to. I've got this ice cream I want to store. You'd have to bring it to somebody to store it, I guess. I don't know. Saloon. Saloon. Woohoo! <laughs> 300 gallons per day. I was really tempted to call up like Newport Creamery. How many? <laughs> How many? How many are you putting out? Three, what a novelty. 300 gallons a day. <laughs> it's a lot of ice cream. This is from, uh, this is from a book that was looking at the uh, natural ice industry in America. But uh, this is for Boston. Uh, they had it for Providence, too. But this is a good idea to see where the ice went to, how much was actually produced. Um, in Boston, they harvested 660,000 tons of ice. Right? And look where it went to. Brewers, right? Brewers. Butchers and meat packers. Um, these people, they, they, they weren't, they knew that, you know, meats went bad. They knew that they had to be careful with this stuff. They knew more about food spoilage than we do, perhaps. We take it for granted now. We have to be warned. Don't leave that out, right? Um, these people thought about it, but they had a hard time cutting meat in that during the summer months because they had to cut it and get rid of it. And so having cold in cold-packed places was very important to them. Butter. And a lot of people who did butter did ice cream. Ships and shipped to other places, private families, miscellaneous consumers. I can't even imagine what that would be. Um, and not surprisingly, too, uh, less ice was used during the winter. Uh, that's that. Hold on. Uh, the, um, I've alluded to the fact that uh, the Arctic ice houses were destroyed by fire. But of course, we look at the date here, 1933. The ice industry was done. Mechanical ice was being produced. The houses weren't housing ice anymore. They were housing old tools. Uh, spectacular blaze, unknown origin. Doesn't that sound suspicious? Yeah. <laughs> Did it for the insurance? They had no insurance. It was a, almost a total loss. The buildings were minimally insured. Just gone. Spencer Borden Jr. called in the fire response for it. Saw the flames. Um, I can't get better pictures of this. The, um, the, the Fall River Herald News, they've been wonderful. M Mary Faria, um, I don't even know if she's still there. Um, this, this is the best we could get out of there for pictures of the fire. Um, it's this kind of stuff. What you're looking at here, this is the wooden ice house, the bigger one that bur burned beside the uh, granite one. And we have, this was from the Fall River City Hall uh, Government Center. Uh, this must have been soon after the, the fire. As you can see, the scorched outline of the big building. And of course, the empty roof here. And of course, it's a nice view of the Borden Estate too. So. A little bit about fires and ice houses. They burned. If you have a building stuffed with wood walls and stuffed with sawdust and straw, you're going to have fires. I don't care if there's ice in it or not. This is in New Jersey. Uh, I just wanted to put that in here. Uh, this <laughs> ice house burned down. The ice remained. <laughs> Apparently, it took a few weeks of hot summer weather to get rid of the pile. Anybody remember the, the blizzard of 78? Those snow piles were just around forever. I think it was June I could still throw a snowball if I wanted to. <laughs> so anyway, that's, I, I feel like I've gone on for too long. I love this stuff. I'm a nerd. I love, you know, I just. <laughs> any, any questions? I, I wish I had encouraged people before. Yes, Joanne. Uh, 
Uh, the, the, the Cunningham House was obviously saved because that's extant to this day. Um, truly, I guess I don't know. I, yeah, no, it's funny. I guess I, guess I don't know. Um, He said what? The Spencer Boarding House, the estate there, that was not affected by the fire? Oh, no, no. In fact, Spencer Boarding was gone by then. Spencer Boarding Jr., his house, um, he, he was, Mike, how far is that? A half a mile? A quarter mile? Yeah, it, it, it's probably a little bit too far away even for passive flames. He saw the flames, though, he called, but it didn't burn down. It didn't burn down. Yes? The ice had to keep moving when they were bringing it in. How did they get it out once it sat there for two years? <laughs> it's, it's funny. These are questions that plague me, too. I'm saying, oh, my God, it must have all been frozen together. Um, truly, a lot, I've, I've read a lot, of, um, a lot of books on how they stored the ice, and they're pretty good at saying how they stored it, how they collect, harvested, and put it in, but not so much in how they got it out. And um, the only kind of answer I have is if you kind of look back here, I know one thing that they used to do is they used to keep a little bit of space between the blocks laterally. And I'm pretty sure they had to put, if you look at this here, that they probably had a little bit of sawdust insulation. I know nobody wanted dirty ice, and, but I think that to get it apart, could you imagine it would just freeze solid. If you've put, you know, you've, you've had a drink at home, the ice will stick together if you, you know, you're trying to clean it later. So, yeah, but they, they had tools too. You know, they used to have to break it apart and, you know, it's, uh, but yeah, that's, that's my best answer. <laughs> yes? Were there any cases of horses and people falling through the ice and drowning while the process was going on to actually cut the ice in the fall river? It, it's, it's funny. Um, I, haven't, I haven't read about it. But I, when, I, um, when I had students doing tours, I had um, one of the students, she was doing a presentation at the ice house itself. And, and she was a bit of a tyro, she was a novice, but she was giving it the old college try. And in her reflection afterwards, she said, you know, she said, I, I felt kind of stupid. There, there were old people in there who knew a heck of a lot more about this than I did. She said, but I felt pretty good because she said there was a woman who came through who said that she had lost her husband, her young husband, who had fallen in while ice harvesting. Yeah, and I'm like, you didn't get the name. Like, I'm so bad. Like, I would, uh, talk to me about him. <laughs> I would go, I would interview her. I'd have to film her. Um, but apparently there were, there were some, but I, 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 didn't, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. Any other questions? Yes, hi. I remember, I think the name of the ice man who came with the truck was Mr. Shea. And we would buy 15 cents for it. <laughs> really? <laughs> did you did you have the placard that they used to put in front of the house to? I, I meant I meant to include one in there. There was a placard. That I guess you could spin it, and whatever price was on top would tell you if you wanted twenty five, fifty, or seventy five cents. Um, they, they, some of those are available too. I, I should probably get one of them too. Yes. Uh, he, is Steph, uh, is Steph? <laughs> they, <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, but you'll, you'll learn a lot more about it next week. <laughs> Stay tuned. Part two. <laughs> yes. The tour that you're going to be giving of the ice house is two weekends from now, not this weekend, but the following weekend. Right. Oh, <laughs> maybe, maybe along uh, Meridian Street. Um, what's really nice is that, you know, it's a protected area. We get to get in, and, uh, but we, uh, we let the neighbors know that we're going in because they're pretty good at reporting people who park illegally. Um, but the police are really good when they know that a tour is going on. And you can just, I, I think parking on the right side of the road is fine. Sometimes it's a little bit of a walk, though, just to get back to the gate. A lot of walking. Bring your good shoes if you're, if you're going to go. Right side is, the side. Yeah. is it? Okay. Yes, hi. Hi. Uh, so you said in the beginning that all of this uh, water uh, was practically free and nobody was really regulating it in the beginning. When was it that either the 
city of Fall River or um, Massachusetts in general started putting laws to regulate who has what. Right. Um, it's funny, I, I was reading a little bit on that because, you, you know, as you, as you start to do a presentation like this, I wish I could say I'm an expert in this, I'm not. I'm just a reasonably curious individual who just likes to do weird things in history, you know. I'm not going to get the big picture, I'll find a narrow one. But I, I was just reading about that today. Um, a lot of the uh, laws for protecting water rights as far as ice harvesting came from Boston with Frederick Tudor. Um, in, but at the, same, at the same time, you have this other set of uh, laws that were starting to take place in America. You have this great sanitary revolution in the country where people are starting to live in cities. And as they live in cities, you're having the, the kind of problems that you get with sickness now with people living close to one another. And so one of the things that they started to pay attention to right away, especially with the Northward Tupper Pond, is that like, when it was decided that that was going to become a water source for the community, they said, well, we really need to keep this clean. And this was right at the end, like they really started to pay attention to it about like the late 1800s, maybe 1885, 1890. Um, and, it, and it resulted in this case of the city condemning all the land around the pond to keep people from building there and protecting it. They even condemned the land under the pond. I don't know if people know that. Yeah, it's one thing to take all the land around the pond, but what if the water goes? You could go in there and steal the land, right? The city condemned the land under the pond too. When I say condemned, I, I mean took hold of it. Any other questions? Yes, hi. I know this, all those horses, every one of them, none of them had blankets on that bit of cold. <laughs> they were busy. <laughs> I guess they had to wear the white suit because that's cool. Is it? I, I, you know, it's funny. I, I know so little about horses. I know they were hired. Um, I know they must have worked pretty hard. I can imagine that was fairly difficult work. Um, I think they had special shoes to be on the ice too, but um, yeah, they would they would need blankets and things like that. Yeah, none of them had. Oh, well, nobody ever commented about that. Not to my knowledge. Wait. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's funny. You, you're kind of at. I, I wasn't there. You know, I, I, you're at the hands of other historians. <laughs> All right. If there are no other questions, no. Thank you so much. <laughs>